Hallelujah. Are y'all ready to praise him? Oh, we're ready to praise him. Let's leave everything behind us. Put it at the foot of the cross if you need to. So we can focus on Jesus. Turn. 
and honor and glory, God. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, praise God. Well, turn us around and find some people that you haven't shaken hands with or hugged yet. Tell them how glad you are they're here, and you can be seated. Praise the Lord. Let me give you some announcements right quick. Uh, the Word Cure is tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, here at the back of the auditorium, which is the Word Cure Healing Center. And so you can just use the back door and come in for that at 2 o'clock tomorrow. And again, of course, that's for you all know, that's for people in need of healing or just wanting to build their faith along the lines of healing. We still need candy, lots of candy. I was told that that's two weeks from today that we're doing it, okay? Two weeks from today. So if you haven't signed up too to have your vehicle be the uh, trunk or treat vehicle, please do that. There should be a sign up for that in the foyer. But also we need lots of candy because we want to give away lots of candy. And, uh, you know, we'll just try to do, uh, we'll, we'll do with whatever comes in. But uh, the goal is not to have each person give a piece of candy to each kid. The goal is to give several pieces of candy from each trunk to each kid. So that's why we need lots and lots. Next Monday is a men and women's meeting, and uh, it is October 18th at 6 p.m. And uh, ladies, you've got to sign up for that. Some ideas and things for you to bring. Actually, need some help. And so ladies, please... Make yourself available for that. Sign up on what you can bring to that ladies' meeting. It's going to be a couple of really, really good meetings, and so I don't want you to miss those. Are you ready to give tonight? Amen. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to pray a general prayer over the offering, and uh, you pray over yours. Glory to God. You know all the promises in the Word of God along these lines? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Those, those... Two, three people that know, share with everybody else. God loves a cheerful giver, hey Ben? Amen. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. We're well able, aren't we? Yes. Hey Amen. We're well able. We're well able despite uh, anything that could happen in the economy. Amen. I, I know that uh, there were some missionaries in some third world nations that they had raised up churches and they got in trouble with God for not taking up an offering. And uh, they said, Lord, well, these people don't have anything. And uh, the Lord spoke to one of them and said, and they never will unless they start giving. You know, that's backwards from the world's way of thinking, you know. Yep. And so uh, that missionary pastor had to correct himself and ask God to forgive him. And he started taking up tithes and offerings just like he would in a church here in the States. And I mean that people started prospering. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's hold our offering up to the Lord. Let's pray over it. Heavenly Father, thank you for this seed. God, we, we bring it in with a heart towards you. We bring it in as a gift to you. Our tithes, our offerings, we thank you for blessing that. We thank you for multiplying that. We thank you, Father, that we have more seed coming to sow. We have an abundance of fruit abounding to us. This church has abundance of fruit abounding to it. We have more than enough for every need. We have more than enough for every project, everything that needs to be done. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you that we can come into your presence. We thank you, Father, that we just don't sing just to be singing, praying just to be praying, coming just to be coming, but that we can alert ourselves, that we can awaken ourselves, that we can realize that you're real. We can realize that you are worthy to be praised, worthy to be worshipped, we can focus on it and be caught up in your presence. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Glory to God. You know, we are to present ourselves, spirit, soul, and body. 
Now, you, you can hear sometimes, you'll hear people say, uh, body, soul, and spirit. And, uh, hey, at least they know what the three-part being of man is. But um, if, if <laughs> they're, they're not putting the priority where the Word puts it, nowhere in the Bible does it say body, soul, and spirit. But it says spirit, soul, and body. But the Bible says that we present all of that. We have been redeemed. Spirit, soul, and body. Hallelujah. Glory to God. His body will be changed one day, but that's because it's redeemed. Praise God. It is not yet glorified, but it will be. So we were talking last week about actually the glorified body. You know, just looking at the example of Jesus of what a glorified body may be able to do. A glorified human body, because you know Jesus had a glorified human body. And so what did he do in a glorified human body? Well, he appeared and disappeared in a glorified human body. He didn't use the door <laughs> when he had a glorified human body. And he'd be in one place and then another place with his human glorified body. So it could be we'll have a human glorified body just like him. He is the first fruits of our resurrection. And so uh, we, we can look to him as an example on so many areas. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 6 because <clears throat> we started looking at and talking about the glory of God in manifestation on the earth, because the Bible says it'll be all over the earth, the glory of God, all over the earth, all over the earth, the manifest presence of God all over the earth, hallelujah. And so Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood a seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Hallelujah. The whole earth. Well, does that mean in Iran? Yeah, that's part of the earth. Does that mean in Afghanistan? Yeah, that's part of the earth. Well, uh, does that mean in China? Yeah, that's part of the earth. The whole earth will be full of His glory. And the posts of the door, it says, were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So you see, smoke is what we might see in this realm as manifestation or what we can see, the glory. We can see the glory. You know, uh, the Goodwins pastored a church in Pasadena, Texas for quite a number of years. My grandparents knew them and uh, went to their church on a couple of occasions. That church was probably, other than uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness, uh, notorious. Well, also, I guess the, uh, you could also say at Azusa Street, the, uh, uh, the warehouse made into a church at, Az at Azusa Street. Uh, was also known for the glory of God. That little Assembly of God church in Pasadena was known for the glory of God, where people would see smoke in there. One man wrote that um, he had been at that church for a while, and there was a particular air conditioner that kept acting up. And so he thought it was that air conditioner again. And that air conditioner, because he saw blue smoke. And he said, oh, it's that air conditioner. So he went and checked the air conditioner, and the air conditioner was fine. Nothing wrong with the air conditioner. He realized what he was seeing, that blue smoke, was glory. The glory of God. You know, we, we had uh, a theme at camp one year. The Lord just directed us what theme to have. And the theme was, show me your glory. And uh, we had little pink shirts that year that said, show me your glory. And uh, um, we heard some testimonies that year. But even the next year, we were still hearing of people that saw smoke. You know, it was at night, and it was in a, it's an open-air uh, facility where you've got a slab, you've got posts, and you've got a roof, you know, sort of like a tabernacle. And then it's just open. There's no walls. And uh, um, the sound man the year, that year was walking up and looking all behind the instruments and following his cables, and he had sound, he had lights, he had lots of stuff. So he was looking at everything. And uh, the next day, I or someone said, what, 
what were you doing? What was going wrong? And he said, I was trying to find out where the smoke was coming from. I said, did you ever find out? He said, no, I never did find out. <laughs> well, it's the glory of God. <laughs> the next year, we had a kid that went up to the band and said, uh, hey, did you, did you bring your smoke machine this year? And they said, we don't have a smoke machine. <laughs> and they said, well, you had all that smoke last year. And they said, we didn't have any smoke last year. <laughs> well, they had seen the glory, the glory of God manifesting. You know, I remember walking into a classroom, and it was in a big auditorium classroom. I think, all, I think it was for all first-year students. And Marty Blackwelder, you all know him. He was teaching that class. And uh, um, it was, it, man, it, it just it had gotten kind of crazy. You know, it was one of those run, shout, jump meetings. And uh, um, actually, it was my second year. I'd been in that the first year, and that's the first time I ever danced in the Spirit. If you've never danced in the Spirit, you should seek such an experience. I'll tell you what, there's no blessing like that. <laughs> Glory to God. But I had never danced in the Spirit in that first year. I, as the first time in that class, I danced in the Spirit. Well, I knew he was having that class again, but I didn't know it would get to that same day that we had, but it did. And I was a second-year student, but uh, um, I had some responsibilities before uh, both years met in that big auditorium. And I had to get some seats reserved and do some things get some flyers ready. So I went in there, and they were still going on. And so I, I snuck in there, and I was like, oh, man, they're still going. Oh, they're having that kind of meeting we had last year. And uh, sure enough, they were. People were dancing and running and shouting the victory. And I, I think he even got some people on stage with the instruments that knew how to play. And uh, um, so uh, they were just having a great time, great time. But I noticed the room, it looked like somebody had been smoking. You know, uh, you're probably not that silly now, but before you got saved, maybe you used to smoke, you know. Uh, maybe you used to smoke cigarettes or tobacco or, you know, uh, any of that nonsense. And now, you know, people are vaping and lacing their vaping and doing other stuff with their vaping and all kinds of nonsense. And I'll tell you, anytime, here's a good rule of thumb. <laughs> anytime you try to... Uh, synthetically make something that's bad for you better for you, you're going to do something worse. All right, that's just a good rule of thumb, okay? <laughs> you're going to do something worse, and what's worse is called popcorn lung, and you can look that up, all right? But anyways, uh, it looks like people have been smoking. Just a haze, you know? You get, you get a group of people, you know, maybe used to play poker or something, you know, and you get some people playing poker, and uh, there's just a haze above the table. I don't know, maybe you're too holy for poker. Maybe you're playing dominoes. You had the same haze and same cigarettes, but you had dominoes. Well, there was a haze over the table from people. Smoking. How many of y'all relate to that? You, you, you've been in homes like that. I know, you used to, you couldn't even, I don't know, it, you couldn't even tell your relatives, don't smoke in my house. It, it was just like considered rude. Y'all remember that? You just, you know, if you had a relative that smoked, you went out and bought an ashtray for them. You know, you weren't about to tell them that they couldn't smoke in your house. It was just considered rude. And so I, I, I grew up in some of them days, and, and uh, we didn't smoke. My immediate family didn't smoke, but when the smokers came over, we had to pretend like they weren't smoking, you know, because we didn't want to be rude. We just had to, <laughs> you know, and try to breathe and go outside and take a fresh air break, you know. And uh, so we go do that. But it didn't look like that. Look at and, and I thought for a minute, man, it looks like people have been smoking in here. But I knew they hadn't, of course. But it was the glory. It was the glory. But it looked like a haze above people that had been smoking. Just a smoky haze. Just a smoky haze. But it was the glory. You know, the glory of God manifests today just like it always has on the earth. <laughs> Amen. You know, that's sometimes we, I think people wrestle with is they think that that, that God just stopped manifesting himself. That God manifested himself up until, you know, 50 A.D. And then God said, you know, I'm done. I've been manifesting myself for 4,000 years. And for the next 2,000, I'm not going to do anything. Uh, Y'all can just have this planet. I'm not doing anything else on it. Well, you know, we, if you listen to people talk, that's their mentality. That's their mentality. No, the manifestations of God, God said, I'm the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. I don't change. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
So, you know, this said the glory of God will cover their whole earth, and it talks about the house was filled with smoke. Well, there's been a haze here sometime like that. There's a haze, just like somebody in here had been smoking. Nobody in here was smoking, but there's a haze. The glory of God was manifesting. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28, Joel prophesied about this day, the day we live in. Remember when we talked about the different ages or the different dispensations. Anybody know what dispensation or age we're living under right now? Grace. We're living in the age of grace or the dispensation of grace. That's right. Joel 2 verse 28, it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Pillars of smoke. Well, we just read by another prophet that his glory would cover the whole earth. Well, what do you think those pillars of smoke could be? You know, what were the children of Israel led by? A pillar of, come on. Amen. So you don't, you don't even have to use your imagination. <laughs> when Joel said that there will be seen pillars of smoke, you know, I wonder what that is. Well, that's the glory. <laughs> that's the glory of God. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Now let's look at Acts chapter 2 because that's how you know. You read that in Isaiah. You read that over in Joel. But this is where you know right here, hey, we're in that time. We're, we're in that time they're prophesying because Peter got up in Acts 2, 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Oh, well, why was he announcing it then? Because that was the beginning of that time. The beginning of that age hallelujah at the beginning of that age is when we got to receive the baptism of the holy spirit at the beginning of the age of grace glory to god isaiah 40 we're just reading about the glory because his glory is going to be seen you know and i told you last time we had a prayer group that uh, uh seems to keep getting things about the glow the glow the members of this church known for the glow well, you can see the glory of God manifested on people. It was manifested on Moses. And, and uh, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so they asked him to veil their face. You know, I saw something today that maybe I hadn't seen before. A lot of people think that God's hiding himself from people. But it seems like God's hiding himself, that people are hiding themselves from God. You know, God didn't say, Moses, make sure you veil your face so they don't see my glory on you. Moses didn't say, you know, y'all don't deserve to look at my face. The people put that demand out there. They didn't want to see the glory of God. You know, today there's people that decide, Christians, well, I don't have to go to church that much. Well, maybe I'll make a Sunday if I can. Well, maybe I, and, and before long, you know, and they say this, you know, people that, you know, when they start out to backslide, they're like, I still love the Lord. Nothing's going to change. I'm just not going to go to church. You know, I, I'm going to just jump into this lifestyle, but nothing's going to change. I still love the Lord. I'm still going to church all the time. I still feel the presence of God. And yet you watch them, and they slip further and further and further and further and further away from the presence of God. Well, you know, that ain't God. That's not God pushing them away. That's themselves been duped by the enemy. The devil has wanted man to stay away from God. It wasn't God that put it in the minds of Adam and Eve. Now that you've done this, hide from me. Don't show your face to me. Hide from me. But what was it in? It was that sin consciousness that they all of a sudden received when they sinned. And it was their idea, I'm going to hide from God. I'm going to hide from God. And God said, where are you? Where are you? We were hiding because we're naked. Oh, you're naked, huh? Who told you that? How'd you come up with that word? You didn't suddenly become naked today. Come on now. The shame, the sin, 
us from the devil. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. It's not God throwing people into the darkness. It's people running into the darkness and not wanting the light. People stay away from church in droves because they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. They don't even know they don't want to hear it, but they don't want to hear it. They don't want to be convicted. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to know about it. They want to do what they're going to do. They'll make up things. Oh, people just don't treat me the same. Oh, people just don't like me. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, nobody accepts me. Oh, they know what I've done, and now I'm just cast out because they just don't have any tolerance. Hmm. Gotta watch that tolerance. Don't tolerate sin. Isaiah 40, verse 5, it says, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I believe God has made attempts after attempt after attempt to reveal himself to mankind. I don't believe it's God's idea to hide from man. I don't believe it's God's idea for man not to see his glory, for man not to see who he is, not to know who he is, not to have an opportunity, a real opportunity to either accept what Jesus did or deny it. A real opportunity. You know, we've been led to believe that those on the earth will just see us no more in the rapture. There's the rapture. Oh, what happened? I don't know. People have disappeared. Maybe it was aliens. You know, all the movies portray it that way, right? Uh, I, I don't know what happened. They were there. Now their clothes are there. You know? You watch all the movies on the rapture, and that's what it is. I didn't see anything except there's people. Now there's people clothes. You know? And you watch the movies, and somebody's, like, bouncing the basketball. I watched one in particular, and somebody's bouncing a basketball. And then all of a sudden, I guess they go up in the rapture, and you see the, bou- the ball <laughs> bouncing down the street. <laughs> and some clothes, of course, laying there. And nobody knows what in the world's happened. I'm going to show you some scriptures, though. I'll just show you some scriptures. You make up your mind. You don't have to make up your mind, but some of these things God didn't put a lot about. Because it really has, it makes no difference. Our, our, the orientation of our mind and our thought process and our priority should be on winning the lost. Getting as many people as can to go up in the rapture. But I'm going to give you some scriptures and show you that God's never had any hidden, private, rising from the dead. You know, the dead in Christ will rise first. That means those who've gone up to be with God are coming back down Their body, which returned to dust, is going to go from dust back to human. It's going to be glorified. They're coming out of the ground and going into the air. You know know what I'm saying? Or they're coming into the old body put back together and getting glorified on the way up into the air. Either way, by the time they get up in the air, it's going to be glorified. (laughs) Well, I don't believe that's going to be a private thing. I don't believe that's going to be a secret thing. I believe people all over the world will actually witness this event. And it may be, I don't know, but it may be that the greatest harvest the earth has seen will will be as this event starts unfolding and those that knew better and those that, that, that have at least had a seed planted are like, uh, I received Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. <laughs> I believe. <laughs> and so the greatest harvest may be. And we read last week about Rebecca's children. You know, we're of the seed of Abraham, right? Because we're born into the kingdom of God. And it was prophesied that Rebecca's children, thousands times ten thousands. We said that's billions. That means there'll be at least billions that go up in the rapture. That's never been possible until within the last century. Billions. Billions. If there's seven billion people on earth, I wouldn't be surprised if three and a half billion, at least half, go up in the rapture. It's going to be big, guys. It's going to be a huge, huge event. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus in the clouds, all of our bodies suddenly glorified, glorified bodies coming out of the ground, going up to meet Jesus, and then with our glorified bodies going up to meet him, and then we disappear into heaven. Then we all go up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's look at Philip first, Acts chapter 8. Philip was translated, but you remember this is the same word, 
caught up. It's the same Greek word. We looked at that last week. Same Greek word is used. That's another indication of a rapture. Caught up, caught up, caught up. You understand. So Acts 8, verse 38 said, So he commanded the chariot. This is Philip the evangelist. He commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Philip was caught away, wasn't he? Okay, did anyone see Philip be caught away? Yes, the eunuch saw him. He was there, and then he was gone. And the people in Azotus saw him there, right? It wasn't a private event, was it? No, nope, nope, nope. Second Kings 2. Second Kings chapter 2. Hallelujah. Amen. Reuben, could you get me just a little bit of water, please, sir? Second Kings chapter 2, verse 11. It says, Then it happened... As they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Well, who was standing next to him? Elisha. And the chariot came in between them. Well, I'd get out of the way too if a chariot of fire was about to run me over. Yeah. I'd make way. I'd say he has the right of way. All right, verse 12. And Elisha saw it. In case you're wondering, he saw it. And cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel. Oh, thank you. Would you tell Reuben that you brought me one? Uh, where are we? Verse 12. And Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. And that's what uh, Elisha crossed over. That's what Elijah had did on the way over earlier. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they saw Elisha. These are also prophets. They said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha, the recognized anointing. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Then they said to him, Look now, there are fifty strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master, lest perhaps the spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. So here's fifty other people besides Elijah that witnessed this. You see that? And this was also a caught up. It was witnessed, wasn't it? Yes. I don't see, we don't know about Enoch. The word doesn't say. But I don't see in the word of God anybody that God ever caught up. And it was a secret. And all anybody knew is they were there. And then there's their clothes. It was always a God event. You understand? It was always a God event and always had witnesses. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. I'm just saying, now, you know, if you want to just, you know, if you want to believe that it'll happen just like they keep doing in the movie where there's people and then there's just clothes and cars crashing into each other and airplanes crashing and whatnot and nobody knows what it is and so they blame it on the aliens or they blame it on this or they blame it on that. You can, but... I believe more and more that God will get all the glory from the rapture. And, and there just won't be any way you could blame it on something else. Uh, you could lie about it later and just, you know, but I believe people will have the knowledge. They can, they can bury it. They can do what they want to with it later, but they'll at least have an opportunity to have the knowledge God is real. God is real. All right. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Did I tell you 15? Good. Verse 4, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I like how 
Paul keeps saying, according to the Scriptures, right? According to the Scriptures. Verse 5, that it was seen by Cephas. You know, that was Peter, right? He was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by, look at this. This is only one place in the Bible, and a lot of people don't really pay attention to this. He was seen by over 500 brethren at once. At the time that Paul penned this, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep or died. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Well, Jesus rose from the dead. He's the first fruits of our resurrection, isn't he? But that wasn't a hidden event. That wasn't a hidden event. Now, when we read the Gospels, which we should, but when we're in the Gospels, you know about Mary seeing him. You know about the disciples seeing him, yes. But you don't hear until we get over into 1 Corinthians that actually 500, more than 500 people saw him. More than 500 people saw that he had raised from the dead. Again, I think that just adds, that just adds, I believe, to proof. People are going to see this rapture thing. It's not going to be a secret event. People are going to see the rapture. They're going to see it. Matthew 27. Can you turn there? Matthew 27. Verse 50. It says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. This is Jesus on the cross, right? It is finished. Verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked. A lot of big events in the Bible. There's earthquakes. I mean, spiritually significant events and changing of ages. There's earthquakes marking it. The earth quakes during these times. The earth quaked, and the rocks were split. And the graves, listen to this, were opened. The graves were opened. So there's an earthquake, earthquakes, rocks are splitting in half, and graves are popping open. You know, uh, I, I've, I've been through a lot of storms, but uh, I've yet to see a grave pop open. I'm not even sure what that would look like, you know. You know, the dirt just go whoop. <laughs> All of a sudden there's dirt, and the dirt goes poof. And now there's a hole straight down to whoever was buried there, straight down to the bones. I don't know. But the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. So this is, this is right when Jesus yielded his spirit, people started raising up from the dead. Now, you know, that'd be one thing if you said, well, you know, Jesus informed us of this, or the Holy Spirit informed one of the disciples of this. But nobody else saw it. This was just a secret happening, just a secret meeting, just a secret thing. Nobody saw it. But listen, listen. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Many. What's the holy city? Jerusalem. So they went into Jerusalem and appeared to many. What, what, how's that significant? Because God's never had just a private resurrection. So why would he have a private rapture? The biggest event that ever hit the earth, it's not going to be private. It's not going to be secret. It's going to be known. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, uh, let's see. Let's turn to Matthew 5. Let's change directions. Big death raisings in history. God's, make sure, God's made sure there was an audience for him. Well, let's, ta- let's change directions now. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. It's, it's talking to you, believers. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. 
Now, we've all talked about this. What, is, what does salt do? Seasons and preserves. Seasons and preserves. You know, before there were electric, electric refrigerators, and even some now, today, people will do the, will smoke meats the old-fashioned way. Well, they do. They'll pack them in salt. They'll pack them in salt. Why? It's a preserving agent. It's a keeping agent. You know? Well, you're the preserving agent on this earth. You know, the son of perdition cannot show himself and can especially not in great detail reveal himself until you're out of the way. You understand that? You're, you're the body of Christ. Satan found that it was really hard to get what he wanted done, done, while Jesus walked around on earth. Yeah, and that was less than three years, a little less than three years. And, and Satan found it very difficult, you know, and it was upsetting. And it was irritating. And so, you know, a plan was devised to kill Jesus, wasn't it? But the Bible said, had the enemy known, had the enemy known, they would have never crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Because once they took Jesus out, not only did we come into the kingdom, but then we got equipped with the same spirit that Jesus had. Yeah. I mean, on one day, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, that's a calendar day. When that day had fully come, all of a sudden there were 120 Jesuses. Okay? And then later on that day, what was it? 3,000 get at it. Hmm? I mean, it just kept multiplying, multiplying. The body of Christ is big. The body of Christ restrains and holds back what the enemy wants to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hallelujah. I'm convinced, and if it happens, I'll apologize to you. <laughs> I'm convinced that there won't be any kind of nuclear holocaust before the rapture of the church. Because it would hinder the harvest. It would hinder the last harvest. I'm convinced of it. Now, if it happens, then, you know, I'll apologize to you once we're in heaven. But I'm convinced it can't. Why? Because it would hinder the harvest. This is going to be big. The harvest is going to be huge, huge, huge. There's also, and, and maybe we'll get to that scripture today. It's in more than one place. But the angels of God are holding back wind. You say, well, what is, what is wind? Wind is, is, is uh, um, human against human. Wind is argumentative. Wind is 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 a uh, war. Wind is is a uh, uh, um, chaos. Now we're seeing a little bit of it, but did you know that before ages change from one dispensation to the other, you usually get previews of the next dispensation? Check out the Gospels. What did Jesus go around doing before he went to the cross? Before he rose from the dead? healing sick and forgiving sins. We were not yet in the age of grace, yet Jesus was doing it. You see previews of the next dispensations before you get to those dispensations. Hallelujah. That's why we've seen, I believe that's why we've seen a blood moon. I believe that's why we've seen some of these other signs. Glory to God. We're getting close. We're getting close. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of God forever. So, you're the salt of the earth. You're holding things back. Look at Revelation 6. Now, it'll take us a while to go through this, but we're going to just go through it slowly. Revelation 6, verse 14. So, right now we're talking about, okay, what next? The rapture's taking place. We set the stage for the rapture. We've set the stage for there will be one. We will be caught up. What happens next? Revelation 6 happens next. Chapter 6, verse 14. Then the sky received as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Okay, let's stop right there. A lot of symbolism in that verse, isn't there? 
Absolutely. Unless, unless you think the sky is going to bloop, 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 bloop. No. No, not at this time. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians 3. Verse 2. 2 Corinthians 3, 2. He said, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. You are our epistle. Well, what's an epistle? Somebody tell me. Somebody tell me. Nobody? A letter. You are our letter. The epistles to the church were the letters to the church. Well, in that day and age, I'd look something like this, wouldn't it? This is you. You are our epistle. This is you. So when it speaks here of the sky received, receded as a scroll, it's talking about you. It's talking about we're caught up to meet him in the air, and then we're gone. We're out of here. This is, this is the rapture. You're receded out of here. You're the scroll. You're the epistle, Paul said. Well, you're gone. You're gone then. The amount of chaos when you take believers out of a society. I, I mean, people may think they hate believers. I mean, people may think that they want a world without us. But when they get their wish, they will wish we were still here. The amount of the enemy we've been holding back is detrimental to the health, to the wealth of nations. There will not be one nation not affected by this event. And everyone will know what happened. We were caught up. We left. Those that had died before us came back and got that old bodies, got them glorified, and they left. And we all met in the air Jesus at this time does not put his feet on the ground we all met in the air and then we're gone we're gone and then it's utter chaos and it takes them a while it takes them a while to sort that out listen listen to some of what's happening here first verse 15 we can do this before we leave and the kings of the earth the great men the rich men you know sometimes you can It's a common thing. Kings, presidents, the very rich. Kings, presidents, the very rich. They hang out together. They have the same security measures in place. You understand what I'm saying? Kings, the leaders, the very rich. All right. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, slave and free men, they hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? And that's one more reason I know they're going to know it. And they all get scared. What's next? Jesus just appeared in the heavens. And people who were preaching the gospel and people left. And people rose up out of the graves and they left. What's going to happen to us? And where can they hide? Well, there's already a, at least one place in Midwest USA where you can go several, several stories underground and leaders have in times where they thought great catastrophe was on the earth Russia I hear that Russia has uh, even better caves than we do and by caves I mean way under the ground you know what I mean to where a nuclear fallout doesn't affect you way under the ground do these places exist are these places already in play? Isn't it interesting that after the rapture of the church, really rich people, kings, or people in authorities, what the word means with kings there, they're all getting into these places, aren't they? 
if the President of the United States isn't saved, <laughs> and he doesn't get saved in the middle of this, and he doesn't get saved, uh, well, I know, I, I'm pretty sure the one we have now isn't, but I'm talking about, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm just pretty, I don't see the fruit of it. I, I just don't. I just don't. I see a lot of other stuff, but, you know, God knows a heart, and I hope he has an opportunity. A lot of people, a lot of people turn right before they're about to burn, okay? So, I, I pray for laborers to go to him all the time, all the time. I pray for laborers to go to him. I pray for people with a brain and people of influence to go to him all the time, all the time. So he's rejecting a lot of people so far, but they're still going, glory to God. Hallelujah. But if the president of the United States, when this happens, isn't saved, he's going down, down, down into a deep bunker because this is... The biggest world event to shake the entire planet at once than has ever happened in humanity. And it will be known. Amen. Praise God. All right. Well, I hate to leave you there uh, in the bunker. <laughs> but if we don't go home, we can't come back. Amen. All right. So we'll go home and come back Sunday. God bless you.